Hello and welcome, you're watching Hat to Hat and I'm Alice Gurdjuk. Today we're talking about small-scale privatization, an important initiative that attracts investments to Ukraine and thus contributes to the development of the Ukrainian economy. According to Ukrainian legislation, small-scale privatization is held through the electronic Prozora sales system. So how exactly does it work and how successful have the auctions been so far? To talk more about this, we welcome to the studio today Ekat Keshelashvili, head of the European Union Anti-Corruption Initiative. Hello and thank you for being with us today. Hello. So first of all, let's explain our international audience what does this small-scale privatization mean in Ukrainian realities? I think it is important to start with explanation of why privatization process is such is so so important in Ukraine. Not that it is not important uh, to then go to the modus of operandi, so to say, of the system. For for decades, privatization process has been ongoing in Ukraine. But then it was imperfect to say at best uh, how the process was uh, completed so far. Even the fact that privatization itself lasted that long in itself is not the good sign of privatization per se when the country has an objective of privatizing most of the state assets that could be privatized. Well, what it was we see, unsuccessful, But it was right? for previous decades. Mm -hmm. But then what we see now is the actual process of privatization that creates trust at the level of the small privatization with openness of the system, transparency and easiness, easiness of application. You're speaking right now about Prozora about the sales. Prozora sales. So okay. the question why privatization is so important now for Ukraine is that it boosts economic activities both at the national and uh, local level as well when it comes to small and medium size of the businesses. And then it allows state institutions who have the need to privatize assets that are already in, in bad shape by this time as well, to, to get rid of them, while for the private businesses to have access to the assets that could be good for their economic activities. But why the system was inefficient before? What was the need to uh, to hold these auctions now through the Prozoro sales system? I would say that system? the system was very complicated in itself. There was no easy way of applying the system. The rules were not that clear. The, the registry of the assets that would have been uh, good and applicable for the privatization was not clear as well, and corruption was part of the deal mm -hmm. as well. So what Prozoro does is, it, if not limits, it actually eradicates the possibility of corruption when it comes to the privatization done through the auctioning system of that kind, and it is extremely easy to apply, mm -hmm. both for the private businesses and state institutions. You just need to package well enough the product as an asset, and it is auctioned then. And then it is easy for private uh, actors to search for the assets that they might be interested in, to participate in the auctions. They don't need to spend time going to different state institutions, take different packs of papers, papers and have an understanding whether or not it worth for them to buy a given asset. But who can register the enterprise for the auction? Uh, in technicalities of that are well explained by the Prozoro sales in that regard, but then it depends on the, I'm, I'm not sort of, we're not responsible obviously for maintaining the system, we're uh -huh, supporting okay. the system mm -hmm. per se. What we've done from the side of the European Union is that the Corruption Initiative, the program that is funded by the European Union, co-funded and implemented by the Danish government, we enabled Ukrainian stakeholders in this case to produce and develop IT modules for privatization, for small-scale privatization for Prozoro sales so that the system would have started to be applicable as early as possible, so mm -hmm. that Ukrainian citizens would have benefited already in a short-term perspective with the goodness that the legislation provided for that. So we've partnered with Prozoro sales to develop the system so that system would have been operational as early as it is, and then already delivering the results to the state and then to the private businesses mm -hmm. as well. So it's already operational. It's already operational, and then the first results are already quite encouraging. There are hundreds of uh, assets that are already sold through the auctioning system. Uh, state fund who manages state uh, assets uh, which are ready for privatization is actively working with Prozoro in, for preparing the assets for selling in the auctioning. And we're and speaking about small-scale privatization. Small-scale yes. privatization. The limit to that is 250 million hryvnas, if I'm not mistaken. So anything the up price to of that the asset. private of the uh, price of the asset. The law sets a different procedure for big assets, and that's a very good and transparent procedure in itself as well. But since uh, for those ob objects we speak about investment portfolio type of privatizations, it would have been very hard to imagine how the auctioning system of that type could have been sufficient enough. So there are two layers into the privatization mm -hmm. How do they this differ? Moment. 
Uh, it's, it's a different technique in the way how privatization is administered. A prosoro sales at the level of the small privatization, it's, it's auctioning easier. system. It's an yes. auctioning system, basically. And it's, it's, it, it's a primarily extremely interested interesting for small and uh, medium-sized businesses at the local level as well. So that when you are opening businesses in different uh, cities or small municipalities, or even in, in big cities, obviously, for that matter as well, for, for medium-sized businesses as well, this is already good enough assets. But when we speak about big privatization, this is investment portfolio-related projects. And there it's a completely different procedure because for the direct investments of that kind, it's a different procedure the way the law prescribes for that mm. to be administered because it's more complex, obviously. So what are the results so far? How many um, small-scale uh, Ukrainian enterprises are already sold? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are already a few hundred, up to 500, if I'm not mistaken. But then 500. we're not uh, tracking as of now the statistics which are moving, but the, the, mm -hmm. the dynamics are very encouraging, as I've said already. Do, do you know the approximate amount of money that Ukraine got from it? I don't have the figures with me right now. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, According to Ukrainian Prime Minister Volodymyr Groisman, uh, the initial price of the enterprises uh, put up for electronic bidding will increase threefold. Why? Um, first of all, it gives uh, competitiveness of the, to the process. Uh, auction has that feature in itself. When different actors are competing in an open way, that's how the usually price goes up as well. Uh, the price itself is not even uh, the biggest factor, if you ask me, when we speak about the beauty of the privatization of this kind, but then bringing back the assets to the economic life and creating economic opportunities based on them. Uh, the price of the assets, and we have to understand that most most of those assets are not the prime assets anymore. They are for decades in a, in a, in not in a well-maintained uh, stage as of now. Are so they bankrupt? I mean, they could be, they, it's not even bankruptcy. They're assets which are physically damaged already because there's mm -hmm. no care that has been taken over them they for, for do not really bring absolutely any so if anybody has an understanding that is the prime object that state was hiding or municipalities somewhere is the golden axe it's not the case those are the assets that are mismanaged for decades right now they are in very bad shape but they're still valuable for the businesses to pick and then to develop out of them the business opportunities restaurants cafes small businesses, IT startup companies, you just name it. So the beauty of privatization is that assets that have been inactive for decades, they will become part of the local economy, will yes, create start jobs, becoming competitive. will create jobs, uh, will create tax revenues out of that. So it's not even decisive, I would say, how much money comes, which will be quite substantial uh, what through I'm the process. Of is that, uh, if the price is increased threefold, maybe nobody will want to buy these assets. Well, the beauty of it is that it's the participants themselves who are increasing prices. The price is not the initial price that is increasing threefold, but the ultimate result of that. So usually prices, the startup prices are not that high. So they the have, startup price will not be increased they, because of it's, this. It's, it's the assessment of the of the asset that is given at the initial stage of bringing into the auction. Mm -hmm. But Who does uh, assess this? Well, these are the sellers themselves as well, because mm -hmm. you have to have an estimate of how much the asset is worth. As you know, in the state institutions, there are procedures through which they have to go through so that it's not an unlimited discretion. What is the price that you set? And there are bodies who can uh, assist state institutions in having an assessment of the assets, expertise, so to say. But the beauty of auctions is that it's the economic calculation of the participants of the auctioning system that decides the price of a given asset based on the location that be or the future plans that any given company has for that particular asset. So it's an empirical evidence through the Prozoro sales system that is already clear here in Ukraine and it's been the same in other countries when the auctioning system is being used. Initial price usually is then ultimately resulting in much higher price when the ultimate bidder wins the process. Speaking about this first results of uh, small-scale privatization, who is more interested in these assets, uh, um, local investors or foreign ones? I would say that it could be a mix, but local investors would be even a dominant factor here because we speak about small and medium-sized businesses. It's not the big investment portfolio projects okay. in that regard, but it could be part of the bigger chains as well. Let's say a company interested to open up the chain of restaurants in Ukraine, you could be looking into different assets in different locations. So that in that case, it could be a foreign investor as well. So anything is possible in that regard. So the bidding itself is quite attractive in terms of easiness of application for, mm. for foreign investors as well, obviously. But the biggest interests are, uh, and it's, it's a 
good thing to have the local interest in it. It's the interest of the local municipalities as well for them actually to get the revenue out of the unused uh, assets and then bring them back to the economic life. And then it's very good for the local actors as well to tap into the new potential of enlarging their business opportunities locally. Of course, yes. Well, you represent the European Union's anti-corruption initiative. So what kind of attempts of uh, corruption did you observe or prevent uh, while uh, well, supporting this privatization? reform in Ukraine? Well, uh, if one would speak about the challenges of the past, it will be a long conversation when it comes to the challenges related to yeah, could potential you compare corruption. Maybe, mm, mm, the, the, the challenges that you had before the launch of this uh, Prozora sales system and uh, since it started operating? I think that the biggest change that one sees already now is that the process is genuinely activated, and that's very important, so that there is a general process that is set by the government to really go through the privatization process, because the ultimate result in a number of the years should be that there will be very little assets to privatize because the privatization needs to be completed. And that's exactly what the prime minister sets as the goal, as much as we understand. And then when it comes to the change, it's profound because instead of having paper-based, discretionary, and uh, an easy to tap into the information even around the process related to privatization, we are different kind of the corruption schemes can easily be, be pursued if there is even any privatization going at that level, then we here we have absolutely transparent system so that there are no question marks as to what was sold, how it was sold, who were the bidders, and what was the ultimate price. And then we'll see once the process goes through if there will be any challenges to that. Mm -hmm. Exceptions can always happen on a given case or two, but it will be really exemplary exceptions that the law enforcement could pick up as well. But uh, I really believe that the trust will be created to the system uh, in, uh, over, the, over the time of its application. Mm -hmm. And then the initial beginning of it is quite encouraging. Well, speaking of these auctions, are only unsuccessful enterprises put up uh, for the auction or also profitable ones? Uh, let's put it that way. When it comes to the uh, premise of what privatization brings to the state is that um, the concept of it, underpinning concept, is that state shall not be doing business anymore. Mm -hmm. So there shall not be profitable enterprises or the assets for the state at national or local level, except in some areas where it's natural for the state because of the security related reasons or some other considerations to have areas of economic activities where state or publicly owned core enterprises are dealing with the businesses. And it's a strategic decision that the state needs to make, which are the limited areas of that kind. But other than that, in the market economy, state is not doing business. State is creating environment for the businesses to operate so that the wealth is created rather than itself being an actor in economic activities. So in that sense, the premise is that it's, it's, it's going in this direction. So it's not picking and choosing which are the bad assets to sell, but to sell as much as can be sold with a good price okay. so that it is going back to the economic life. This is very interesting. Well, uh, I want to mention that first Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Economic Development and Trade Stepan Kubiev said that 3,444 enterprises operating in Ukraine bring very low income. Should all they be privatized then? As I've said, it's the decision of Ukraine, obviously, mm -hmm to define the fields in which some of them will have to be remain publicly owned to for, for whatever reasons as, uh, as a sovereign country, Ukraine could limit to that. But other than that, I'm a firm believer in, in privatization. Economic uh, vibrancy when it comes to the competitiveness of the economic actors cannot be compared with the way how, no matter how well intended, any state institution or publicly owned company could be. Mm -hmm. Private entities uh, which are competing with each other in the market economy environment are much more apt to be flexible, creative enough for, for adjusting themselves to the new economic realities rather than publicly owned companies. And, and then beyond that, publicly owned companies always have the challenge of having a space for corruption because it's the public money, it's not the profitability that is measured in that regard, and then vested interest could be part of it as well. So while fighting with the corruption, it's much more prudent to limit that space where the corruption of could course. be an issue rather than other I understand around. your point. But if we assume that these 3,444 enterprises should be privatized, um, is it 
a large figure comparing to other countries or not? Well, it uh, would depend, obviously, what we have in other countries, because in most of the countries, there are no privately owned enterprises, perhaps, at all. So, ah, compared so to those states... it is a large figure. <laughs> obviously. Okay. It depends on the economic, uh, microeconomic sort of uh, concept with, of arrangement of, of governance in any given country. In the post-Soviet space, we all suffered from large number of the pl private uh, state-owned enterprises, and different countries took different uh, choices in, in eliminating that number number, for example, or maybe maintaining some of it. But what can be said uh, based on the empirical evidence in countries where we have well-developed uh, economies is that, except for the few exceptions, uh, there is no tendency of enlarging the, the uh, institutions in private sector that would be owned by the public and then governed by the um, public institutions. Well, thank you so much for your very interesting thank comments you. and thank you for being a guest today in our studio. Thank you. That was Ekat Kashalashvili, head of the European Union Anti-Corruption Initiative. Thank you for watching Head to Head and stay tuned for more with UATV.